Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. Dear brothers and sisters, this morning the gospel reading is the, the reading about the Pharisee and the tax collector, or the old name for it, the Pharisee and the publican. Not the Republican, but the publican. That, that is to say, the tax collector. The tax collectors used to be called publicans. So, in any event, this, this parable, brothers and sisters, is supposed to be striking to us with irony. It's, it's a very ironic kind of parable. And the reason it's ironic is because two people go to church to pray, and one of them, God's prayer, God is happy with his prayer, and the other one, God is not happy with his prayer. And the strange thing is, it's, it's not who you think, right? You come into the parable thinking, well, this Pharisee, and the Pharisee, you know, Pharisee is kind of a bad word in our modern English, but that's because we know the story. The Pharisees were people who were very religious. They were people who were followed all the rules. They were very pious people. And so the Pharisee comes into the temple to pray, and, and God doesn't accept his prayer. It doesn't do any good for him. And on the other hand, you have this very sinful person, this tax collector, and the tax collectors were even worse than the IRS, <laughs> right? And they were very awful people who were traitors to, to, to Israel. They were people who enriched themselves uh, and by, by betraying the people and extorting people for, for money and got rich off of this. This terrible person, this absolutely awful person comes into church into the temple, and God accepts his prayer and receives him, and not only receives him, but uh, but indeed, if you look at, a, at an icon of this parable, if you look at an icon drawing of this parable, one of the things you see is, is um, that they both come into the temple, and they're both making their prayer, but as they leave, one of them has a halo. One of them has a halo. His face is shining with light. And it's the tax collector who is shining with light. He's, he's, he's become a saint. He's become a saint. In that moment, he became a saint, according to the iconography. So what is it, therefore, brothers and sisters, that, that makes this happen so that we can pray in the right way, so our prayers can be rightly directed to God? Well, it is simply this. It is the, the question of what was in the heart. What was in the heart of each person? When that Pharisee came into the temple, he came with so much arrogance. He came with so much arrogance. He was proud of himself. He boasted himself, not only in his own thoughts, but he boasted himself before God as if he had anything good apart from God that he could boast of. What did he offer to God? What did the Pharisee come into the temple to offer to God? He offered to God his virtues. He offered to God his virtues. And God didn't need his virtues. God didn't have any use for that. He kept lifting himself up. And lifting himself up, not only lifting himself up, but lifting himself up by shoving everybody else down. He came not only with arrogance, but he came with contempt. Contempt for everybody else. I'm so much better than everybody else. Well, what does God do with this prayer? Nothing. It's a useless prayer. He's wasted his time. All the time he spent getting to the temple and offering this prayer to God was a total waste. He would have been better not even to bother. But this tax collector, the sinful man, comes in. And what does he do? He says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And he beats his breast as a sign of, of how deeply he feels this. This is a prayer of intensity. It's a very intense prayer that he's offering to God, and he doesn't even lift up his eyes, and, you know, but he just simply bows his head. He doesn't even dare to lift his eyes to heaven. Now, a lot of people would say, well, that's not a very healthy way for him to, you know, mentally, psychologically, that's not a very healthy state for him to be in, right? But the reality is, brothers and sisters, that he saw the real, he was living in the real world. He saw himself for who he was. He was a sinner. He was a great sinner. He was a man who had done great evil. 
And he saw that. And his prayer to God reflected that reality that he was aware of. He came to see this, and so having come to see his sins, which were great, he came to God with fear and trembling. He came to God with humility, and he offered to God. What did he offer? His virtues? They're non-existent. What did he offer to God? He offered his sins. He offered his sinfulness to God. He said, here I am, God. I'm, I'm a sinful man. Have mercy on me. Pour out your loving mercy upon me. And you know what? God heard his prayer. God heard his prayer, and he justified him. He made him a saint. He made him holy. He filled him with his grace. He filled him with his loving kindness. And the kicker for the parable, the Lord says, whoever wants to exalt himself, you're going to be humble. But if you humble yourself before God, God will exalt you. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you, there's a big difference between when you exalt yourself and when God exalts you. Because if you exalt yourself, you feel good about yourself for a minute, and then you die, right? When God exalts you, he exalts you to the highest heaven forever. He honors you as his own son or his own daughter. And he glorifies you. He fills you with joy. That is to truly be exalted. The exaltation that comes from God. But it doesn't happen because you pride yourself on how great you are. It happens because you humble yourself before God and acknowledge your sins. Now that can be hard to do. Sometimes it's hard to see our sins. Of course, it was easy for the tax collector. He had such big sins and so many of them. It was easy for him to see his sins and, and therefore be humble. But for all of us, brothers and sisters, our task is the same thing. It is to see our sins and recognize our sinfulness and not simply think, oh, I'm great and wonderful and ignore everything that we do wrong, but to see our sins and truly acknowledge our sins before God, confess our sins before God and humble ourselves before God and he will exalt us. Indeed, I would even say this, the more we can humble ourselves before God, the more he will, more highly he will exalt us. How, how exalted do you want to be in God's kingdom? How high up do you want to be? The only way to do that is to go low, to humble yourself before God. Not something the world teaches us how to do. The world even says, well, that's unhealthy. That's an unhealthy way to be. But brothers and sisters, I say to you, say to you, if you can humble yourself before God, not just in your thoughts, but with your body, humble yourself before God with your body that God has given you. Bow before God. Prostrate yourself before God. Come to realize where you stand before God properly on our knees on our faces when we humble ourselves before God he will lift us up he will lift us up beyond what we can imagine beyond what we can dream but we have to have the humility in church sometimes there are points in the service when there are bows right we make a little bow before God right how hard is that not very difficult when we bow our heads to God how difficult is that it's not very difficult but sometimes we don't want to do it sometimes we don't want to do it because we know oh, people are going to look at me or whatever Lord remember Zacchaeus last week he climbed up in that tree he didn't worry about what everybody thought he climbed up in the tree to be close to the Lord to see the Lord brothers and sisters let us humble ourselves before God church gives us the means to do this encourages us to do this let us humble ourselves before the Lord and the Lord in his great love 
In the Lord's great love for us, he will exalt us beyond our wildest dreams. May this be what, what occurs for us, brothers and sisters, in this coming great Lent and every day of our lives and every prayer that we offer to God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. It never shall be.